Hello, everybody. As always, I'm Bart Massey, and as always, I hope you're staying safe and well out there during these difficult times. This is open source software development. And today we're going to talk about the first of three parts about one of the more complicated subjects in open source, which is the legal part. And so I want to start out today with just a basic framing of the basics of intellectual property law. If that's something you're already comfortable with, you may be able to skip this, but if you're not, then you should hang around and maybe we can get this kind of stuff straightened out. And I'm really going to start with the law in general, but the first thing I'm really going to start with today is a disclaimer that I am not an attorney. I want to be very clear about that. None of what I'm going to say constitutes competent legal advice. I'm just from the point of view of this, a person in front of a classroom talking about a topic that's not their topic area. So you shouldn't rely legally on anything that I say. You should get a competent attorney instead. But having said that, I have banged around the industry doing this kind of stuff for a while, and so I do have some idea of how all this works. Let's start with just the basics of the US legal system. So, and again, unless I say otherwise, everything I say in these lectures is US centric. I do not know international intellectual property law because it's very different in some ways. I'll try to mention when there's international law that applies, but in general, each country has its own way of dealing with things. Um, the US legal system is split into two parts. There's the criminal system in which the government uh, punishes violations of the law in various ways after going through a criminal trial. And a criminal trial is a trial where the plaintiff is the state and the, def the defendant, you know, the government, and the defendant is some person. And because the plaintiff is the government, the rules are to protect the defendant are a little different. And they include things, very familiar things, like you're innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable shadow of doubt. You have the right to remain silent, blah, blah. And those kinds of things are set there to try to protect you from a government that might be overreaching if you're a defendant in a criminal trial. And the penalties in a criminal trial can be severe. They can, in extreme cases in some US states, mean loss of your life, very long, definite terms of imprisonment. And so this is the system that we're most familiar with. If we watch on TV, a lot of it's about criminal system, but you'll also once in a while on TV see talk about the other half, which is the half that makes the papers at least as often, which is the civil justice system, which is an entirely, not entirely, but 90% independent system of justice. It works through similar courts, at least at the first level it has, you know, but it's, it's a whole different thing. And this is for grievances where a plaintiff is some person and the defendant is another person. And in the civil system, I can appeal to the government to have somebody redress any grievance I have. And those grievances aren't in general, because this is a very old, old system, older than the United States, limited to things that are in law. Uh, I can sue you any time I feel you've done me a wrong. But especially if the law says that under certain circumstances you've done me wrong. And I can ask for redress, which almost always means that you compensate me financially for wrong that I have done. Now, sometimes I can ask you to stop doing something you're doing that's hurting me. Sometimes I can ask you to do something to keep from hurting me. But most of the time it's about money. And because this is one person suing another, the burdens are a little different. Instead of innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, 
we have preponderance of the evidence. If it's more likely than not that the plaintiff is in the right, then the plaintiff is more in the right. And if it's less likely than not, then less. And so that's a much different burden of proof for the defendant versus the plaintiff. The other thing is that this compensation can be proportional too. If I'm determined as defendant to be 40% in the wrong, I can pay 40% of the compensation that's being asked for. And so this is a very, very different system. And it's got its own adventures. And the reason that I'm making such a big deal out of this difference is because most of what we'll talk about today, most of what of so-called intellectual property law is actually a matter of the civil system, not the criminal system. So what happens if you sue someone or what happens if someone sues you? There's a trial. In most states, even for civil trials, as I understand it, you're entitled to a jury, but if both sides agree, they can have their stuff settled by a judge. Most civil cases don't go to trial because going to trial is very expensive and the outcome is very risky. Nobody knows exactly what will happen in a courtroom and neither side usually wants risk. So instead, there will typically be some kind of settlement pre-trial. If you do get to trial and you get a verdict you don't like, usually at least one side does, then you may, and I'm not an attorney, but it, given reasonable grounds, which there almost always are, appeal to a higher court. And in principle, as long as higher courts are willing to continue hearing your case, you could go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court in the United States. Um, typically, but not always, damages will be reduced against the defendant or the if you know at, at, at each level of appeal uh, against the you know injured party at each level of appeal but you know there it's always hard to know how these things will go and it can get very expensive and take a lot of time it wouldn't be uncommon for a complete civil proceeding to take a decade or two there were people in the civil proceeding of the u.s government versus at&t that started their career fighting that lawsuit, ended their career fighting that lawsuit. It wasn't over yet on both sides of that aisle. So yeah, this is a long, complicated process. And so, especially with the civil system, it's complicated. How are these cases decided? Do the judges or juries just make it up as they go along? Well, of course not. Instead, there's two things. There's the law, the black letter law. Remember, each state, has its own state law. Uh, there will also be municipal laws in some cases that are applicable, although not typically in an IP case, but every state's going to have its own state IP law. And then there's going to be the federal IP law, which there's rather a lot of, which describes the circumstances under which, in the opinion of Congress, which is the opinion that matters here, signed off by the president, the civil plaintiff or defendant should win their case and what the terms should be like. But of course, laws are hard to write precisely. They're hard to write accurately. And so instead, what we actually get is that a lot of the law isn't written by the Congress or by the state legislature. It's written by the uh, decisions themselves. This is what's called precedent. And when a judge decides a case, or a jury decides a case and the judge writes down the facts of that decision, what happened in that case, that becomes a precedent that other courts may choose to use to resolve decisions. And typically, courts feel very bound by relevant, close in time, close in space, jurisdictional precedent. By the way, jurisdiction, what does that mean? Well, every state has its own courts, then there's the whole federal court system. Uh, which courts are involved in these cases can make a big difference. But certainly if last week the court in my district ruled some way in a particular case and they get a very similar case this week, they're very likely to simply look at that decision if it's presented to them as you know a reminder by one of the attorneys and say, yeah, we're going to rule basically the same way this time. 
So when we talk about the law, we mean this whole body of things that will cause a judge and jury to rule one way or another. And one of the things we have to be really super clear about in this situation is that it's never very clear how a judge or jury will behave. All you can do is make guesses based on law and precedent and hope that things will turn out the way you want them. Because there's so much uncertainty, because there's so much variance in the legal process, civil suits get pretty messy and complicated, and thus, typically, we settle them out of court. So that was a lot. Let's take a deep breath. That's U.S. justice system in, you know, legal system in 10 minutes. That's going pretty quick. Let's now talk about what they call intellectual property. Now, the term intellectual property is what's called a term of art. Attorneys use the term, they all know what they mean. Courts use the term, they know what they mean. But there's no such thing as technically as intellectual property law. Intellectual property comprises a series of kinds of things that the courts in the last couple hundred years through law and precedent have decided to treat like their property really treat like they're real estate, right? Property has sort of three phases in the law. There's originally this tangible property. This is my shovel, which I own. And if you steal my shovel, then you've committed a crime, presumably. If you damage my shovel while using it, then you may have wronged me, and I may ask you to repair the shovel. And if you refuse, then I may take you to court. That would be a civil case. But later... The concept of real estate, real property, quote unquote, became a thing. And in real estate, I don't have any tangible goods. I can't steal your house. I mean, I can in the sense that I can claim legal ownership of it to which I'm not entitled, but I can't typically pick it up and move it with a crane over to my property. So, and the, the property itself, I certainly can't pick up and move over to my property. So we have this abstract stuff, and the law doesn't like, the you know, legislators don't like to, and judges don't like to figure out new stuff all on its own, and so they use precedent and analogy, and they treat it like physical property. And now Gutenberg comes along and disturbs everything, and later somebody invents computers and stuff. And during this period, we create more and more kinds of sort of intangible property that people might feel legitimately entitled to protect. And so we create, again, laws based on the laws for physical property that work more or less well to safeguard people's rights in their not physical, not real estate, intellectual assets. That's IP. When we talk about IP, we're talking about essentially four kinds of law. The, the big four in intellectual property are copyright law, patent law, trademark law, and the law of so-called trade secrets. And we'll talk about each of those in turn. The big one from the open source point of view, the one that we're going to spend, these are really in the order that we are concerned with them in open source, and copyright is the big one here. It's, absolutely the thing that a lot of people think of first when they think of open source and the law. So what's a copyright? Well, the first thing we should say about copyright is that the term doesn't mean what you think it does. But we're not talking about the right to copy things. We The term copy here is used in the old sense that's used in newspapers of some kind of created written thing, right? Originally copyright was mostly about words on paper. And so these are rights that you have in copy that you create. And the idea here is anytime you have a creative expression, anytime I write down or sing or paint or whatever, some creative, human readable, human appreciable thing, then I should have some right to that because it was my work. It was something I did. That's the idea. And without getting into the actual history of copyright, that's that's the concept that it currently embodies. And 
it turns out that this is a right that's written into the Constitution to some limited U.S. Constitution to some very limited half sentence way. It has a limited duration, although C. Eldridge, if you want to find out how complicated that story is, the current state of the law is that everything done since about 1930, every book or play or newspaper written, every painting, every movie, every concert, since about 1930 is copyrighted and always will be copyrighted. That's a very, very oversimplification of a very complex topic, but it's a good enough rule to live by. And I could get into, you can Google the phrase Mickey Mouse Protection Act if you want to understand how that 1930 thing became a bright line in the sand. But suffice it to say, that's basically the state of copyright. They theoretically expire, but in practice, the copyright period keeps getting extended just as fast as needed to keep it always in the field. How do you get a copyright? According to international law, and this is an international treaty that's signed by basically all the countries of the world, the Berne Convention, you get copyright in a work by creating it. Literally need do nothing else. Now, there are things you can do to in the U.S. to increase the amount of damages that you get in a civil suit over copyright. There are things you can do to make it clearer who holds the copyright in a work. Principal thing here are copyright notices and copyright registration with the Library of Congress. But essentially, the moment you create a copyrighted work, you own a copyright in it. And what that means is that you are the sole holder at the point where you create the work of the right to reproduce the work, the right to prepare works based on that, what we call derivative works, so prepare modified versions, the right to distribute copies. Yes, copies are confusingly a part, but not all of copyright. The right to perform, display, really to execute <laughs> in computer on a computer the work these are all your rights as the creator. And unless you share those rights with somebody, unless you give these rights to someone else under some terms, then they're yours. Nobody else can do anything with it. Notice how these rights are enforced. They're all, this is going to be the same story for essentially all of this. This is civil suit. If you reproduce my copyrighted work without consent, if you distribute copies without my consent, if you do any of these other things that are covered under copyright law, without me saying you can, then that is typically, except in some really weird special cases, not a criminal act. The government won't come after you for it. If I call the police and say, that man copied my novel, Police are going to be like, well, that's really too bad, sir. You should take that up with the person. And the way you do that is by bringing a civil suit. And you say, this man, to the courts, this man damaged me by copying my novel. I want him to get rid of all the copies he's made of the novel, and I want him to pay me some money to cover my lost sales. And that's your only recourse, is to get involved in a legal case and most of the time and so that's copyright and software is absolutely copyrightable it's considered since apple v franklin 1982 if i remember right maybe later than that um apple v franklin established that even binary code is copyrightable source code has always been copyrightable because it's obviously something written by humans it's creative expression and so unless you have the copywriters holder's permission you can't play with it um pretty much in any way some very very limited uses you can make under law so that is why open source is such a big deal is because we'll be giving away our rights under copyright we'll be sharing them to use another term that's often used rather than holding on to them or trying to negotiate some 
serious su substantial compensation for that those rights patents copyright covers expressions covers particular things you absolutely can make a novel about an estate in the reconstruction reconstructed south you absolutely cannot take any portion of the text or even the title of gone with the wind because those are copyrighted um the further if you get too close and i picked on this example because there's the famous wind done gone case in which somebody wrote a parody of gone with the wind that was deemed sufficiently close to the original that's enough to be guilty of copyright infringement but in general even though the courts are more and more liberal every year on this ideas can't be copyrighted but if the idea is useful if it's new and useful it's a practical invention then you can cover it with what's called a utility patent and i'm only going to talk about utility patents there's several kinds of patents in u.s law but i want to talk about utility patents today because they're the ones most relevant to software and what that does is gives you the right to practice that invention, to be the sole person who can make and use that invention during the patent period. Patents have a much shorter period than copyright. Patents are renewable to a 20-year period. I believe it's 14 renewable. And during that 20 years, the only way anybody can use your invention is if they license your rights to it once you've been granted a patent. Now, I should be clear that this is substantially different than copyright. In copyright, you can't copy my creative work, but if you were to somehow independently come up with something the same, well, I mean, you know, you can prove it, then you're entitled to it. That isn't the case with patents. If you invent the same thing three years later, three years after my patent goes into effect, or three years after the date, starting date of my patent, tough luck. You still can't use it without my permission because I invented it first, according to the courts. So that's why the time is limited. How do you get a patent? Well, it's not as easy as copyright. You don't just automatically have one every time you invent something. You have to apply through the US Patent and Trademark Office, whose name you know, shouldn't surprise you too much here. And typically that's a very complicated process. It will almost always, if you're gonna get a patent that's worth anything, require the services of a knowledgeable patent attorney. And that means that it's gonna cost you anywhere from probably 10,000 to 50 or 100,000 dollars depending on how much how complicated the patent it is and how good a patent you want to get through that process but let's say 20,000 dollars 20,000 dollars you should be able to get a reasonable patent so it's a very expensive difficult process and that process has multiple stages the patent office at least in principle will push back on your patent and say this part of it isn't a new invention and here's why you'll have to justify it the patent terms will change but when you've got that you have the right to practice your invention and again the enforcement mechanism is civil suit if somebody else takes your fancy algorithm and puts it in their computer program after you've patented that algorithm then you can sue them principle algorithm patents are really new we, we haven't had those for very long originally uh, algorithms were considered part of mathematics and no mathematics is patentable but at some point the government actually leaned on the courts to make software patentable and finally passed legislation that made software patentable so now you can have software advantage you can get utility patents on software and if you want to see a bad software patent that probably should never have been granted because the patent claims are garbage and the invention is not really an invention, the way you do that is you go to any patent database, Google has one, the USPTO has one, and you type in a random recent number. You'll be looking at a bad software patent. And almost for sure. Maybe not. Maybe you'll see a good software patent, or maybe you'll see a patent for something that's not software. Well, I'll skip forward one or two. You'll 
software patents. Software patents are everywhere. They absolutely plague the industry at this point. And the fact of the matter is that you probably can't write software at this point that does anything interesting without violating somebody's terrible software patent. The good news is the situation's gotten so ridiculous that there's really no way that anyone's going to enforce against you. And so for the most part, you can just ignore it. Unless you're in a very specific situation where there's it's known to be enforceable, you just go about your day and wait for the cease and desist letter. And I'll talk about that. But the point is, the patent gives you, is a very expensive thing that gives you a right to sue somebody. Spend some more money. It does cover ideas. It's not just... Uh, so for a very, very long time, a company called RSA Associates, named after the founders, Ravesh Shamir and Adelman, owned the patent on RSA public key cryptography, which was for a long time the only practical method of public key cryptography. And during that time, if you wanted, during that 18 years that they owned the patent, if you wanted to uh, do public key cryptography, you had to license that patent software you had to license that patent from RSA Associates. The end result of that was that basically banks and the government used cryptography, nobody else did because they didn't want to pay license fees. There were all kinds of crazy workarounds and 18 years or so in RSA decided that rather than trying to jigger with the patent system they'd abandon their patents to RSA because they'd gotten enough money out of it. It was really cool and at that point RSA exploded. It went everywhere within it. So you know, this is one of the effects of the patent system. Is that... Anyway, from the point of view of open source, the patent system is less relevant, but you'll see things in open source licenses about patents and patent grants and patent discrimination and blah, blah, that are worth paying attention to. Some licenses are mostly about copyright. Third kind of intellectual property law, and I apologize, I know this is long, but we need to get through this stuff. Trademarks. What's a trademark? It, it covers any kind of distinguishing mark for your product or service. So the obvious trademarks are names. Coca-Cola is a trademark of the Coca-Cola Corporation. Uh, the red color of the can. It, that particular shade of red, when used for soft drinks, is a Trademark of the Coca-Cola Corporation. You can't use that color on your soft drink. The swooshy logo thing, that's a trademark of the Coca-Cola Corporation. The phrase, things go better with Coke, has been trademarked by the Coca-Cola Corporation. So the taste of Coca-Cola, trademarked by the Coca-Cola Corporation. And so, although there's some question there about functionality versus color, blah, Itself. So, all that stuff is stuff that identifies Coca-Cola as its own unique brand. And as long as you're trading in that, and as long as you have there again gone through the U.S. Patent Trademark Office, registered your trademark, and they've approved it, which is not a terribly expensive or difficult process in the case of trademarks. It costs eh, maybe a thousand bucks to get a trademark, maybe less. And doesn't take very long and isn't very hard unless there's some kind of conflict. Then other companies can't, other individuals, companies, whatever, can't use your marks on their stuff. The idea here, which I think is a very ethically meritorious one, is to prevent confusion. Did I get this beverage that says Coca-Cola on it from the Coca-Cola Corporation or was it sold to me by somebody else who didn't live up to Coca-Cola's high standards. Is it gonna be Coke? Is it gonna taste like Coke? I don't know. Well, yeah, I do because, you know, the Coca-Cola Corporation trademark on there guarantees to me that it's gonna be a true Coca-Cola Corporation. And that includes, you know, similar marks and blah, blah. I can't call something, you know, Coca-Cola with a Q in the second position. I can't, you know, use you know, a, a thing that's the Coca-Cola logo only backwards. You know, the the courts under law and the, in the and in precedent won't let you mess with that kind of stuff. 
again, though, the enforcement is civil suit. There's no federal crime of trademark violation, no state crime of trademark violation. Your redress here is to go after them with lawyers when they... Uh, in Oregon, the Tillamook Creamery is famous for a couple of fairly nasty lawsuits against people they claimed were, were violating their trademark of Tillamook really is a town name that is generic but they were granted a trademark on the Tillamook Creamery and boy have they extended on that and so you know they'll go after you if you use Tillamook the wrong way or Bandon or the woodcut of the lighthouse or a lot of things so those civil suits can happen but that's really the only redress those people last kind of intellectual property law which is basically irrelevant to open source is the law of trade secrets now trademarks relevant because you can't name your thing something that makes it look confusingly like it came from some commercial company. I can't call my, uh, you know, my, I probably shouldn't call my open source word processor Word or my spread, certainly shouldn't call my spreadsheet Open Excel. If I call it Open Excel, Excel's a trademark. Word, you could argue about whether it's trademarkable, but Excel, you really can't. And so if I call my spreadsheet Open Excel, Microsoft is going to come after me and sue me because uh, you know it may be open source i may have granted copyright there may not be patents involved but boy is there a trademark but the last thing trade secrets is eh, very out there in left field i mentioned it really mostly for completeness it turns out that as a matter of law in some states and in some ways federally and certainly as a matter of precedent if you as an employee of, a, of an organization or company have know some secret of the company that they have chosen not to disclose, for example, not to patent, which would put the secret in the public space where you can see it, not to copyright, which would require registering with the copyright office at least, um, but have decided to keep it private, then you as an employee are not allowed without permission to disclose it. If you do, then you're subject to, there again, civil suits, just like you'd expect. But in some cases, in California, for example, uh, cri there's criminal laws against disclosing trade secrets. So an example of that would be the uh, trade secret formula for Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola hasn't patented the formula for Coke. They haven't trademark copyrighted they haven't done anything they haven't disclosed it they've kept it in a secret vault it's very famously has ridiculous amounts of security that don't even really make sense but if an employee were to find out the secret formula for coke and disclose it to the public they would absolutely be sued off the planet and might go to jail so yeah welcome to trade secrets the only place this is relevant to open source really is that if you use source code that somebody disclosed to you, if you knowingly use source code that somebody disclosed to you when they when it was trade secret and they were supposed to keep it secret, you can also be liable for trade secret violation and deal with the civil and criminal. So don't use source code unless you know that the person who's sharing it with you has a legal right. So what's a so how is this all? I've talked about all these rights, these four kinds of rights, uh, copyright, patent, trademark, and trade secret that you get over property in various ways. In open source, we wanna share these. How do we do that? Well, we write a contract, we write an agreement to perform an exchange, and that's all a contract really is. And the particular kind of contract that we're talking about is typically a license which is I grant you my rights, my intellectual property rights under intellectual property law. I grant you my rights under copyright. Some are all of them forever or for some limited duration. I grant you my rights under patent law. Use the patents that are exercised in my invention for the purposes of code, um, you know, patent inventions I have in my code for the purposes of working with my code. I, I can license that stuff over to you. And in open source, we do, and those open source licenses are kind of a big deal. 
And in the next lecture, I'll talk about the process of giving someone an open source license and getting your legal setup right. In the lecture after that, I'll talk about specific open source licenses and their properties. We'll talk about the commonly used open source licenses. Last thing I think it's really important for me to say before we stop, although this has gone on way too long already, is that you know, I've talked to you today as a layperson. I'm not an attorney. I'm clear about that. I feel like I know enough about our legal system to function as an open source developer day to day under normal circumstances without ever having to worry about attorneys. That's going to be the position of most open source developers most of the time. Stuff all sounds really scary, but really at the end of the day, you don't spend that much time on it if you've set it up right. But when things get weird, you need to find a lawyer. Talk to a lawyer who's knowledgeable and qualified and legally qualified to practice in your state and qualified to deal with your particular kind of problem. And that can be expensive. Attorney, uh, uh, an initial consult might cost you two, three, four hundred bucks, really, with anybody good, unless it's free. There's a lot of places that, especially for open source developers, can provide some level of consulting and initial setup for nothing. But the point is, if you have something that's outside your legal comfort zone, sure, you can ask me. I'll, I'll give you some advice. But what I'm likely to tell you is what you probably should have done without me, which is go find an attorney and talk. The law is complicated. Just like software is complicated, the law is complicated. And people spend just as long learning to deal with the law as they do learning to deal with computer programs. So it's really important to understand that there are professionals and that when things get serious or weird, the professionals are who you should go to. That said, like I say, next time what I want to talk to you about is how to set up your stuff so that hopefully those situations never arise, just like they basically never arise for me. And get yourself set up to where you can quit thinking about the legal stuff and think more about software that's the goal thanks so much for listening like i say stay safe and well out there and i will talk to you again soon